Happy Thursday, everybody, and welcome to episode 65 of the Snyder Cut. I am your host, Jeff Snyder, senior film reporter at Collider.com, and this is the Happy New Year episode, guys. It is the last day of 2020. Good riddance to this year, right? Oh my God. What a nightmare shit show of a year it's been. But we're about to turn the page, and it's not that 2021 is going to be immediately better. You know, tomorrow is tomorrow. It's no real different than today. But there is, you know, there's hope on the horizon. There's a reason to be optimistic. The vaccine is starting to roll out there. We got a new president. Uh, Variety's, sorry, Variety. Collider. Collider's got new owners. Um, And, uh, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what the year brings and what this Oscar season brings, too. Like, I'd love to get FYC up and running more regularly. Um, We got... I mean, we got four more months until the Oscars. We're going to be talking about the movies that we talk about in this episode uh, for for a lot longer. Um, And yeah, there's just a lot of exciting change on the horizon. You know, all of Warner Brothers movies are going to HBO Max. Like, what's that going to look like sitting down to watch a gigantic blockbuster, hopefully a good one, (laughs) uh, at, at home? It could be interesting. So anyways, this is the top 10 episode. This is where I'm just going to kind of recap the year, the year in review for film and television. That's right. And we're going to start with the television portion of the list. I know you guys, you know, you come for the film recommendations. And I did, I did hit number 200 on the year. So I I met my goal. I am at 201 movies, so 202 if you count one under embargo. As of right now, December 31st this morning, yesterday I hit the 200 mark. Uh, So yeah, very, very proud of myself. I feel accomplished. Although then again, I wasn't doing much else this year. So where do I want to start? Let's start with television. The In Snyder's top 25 TV shows of 2020. And guys, if this, if this goes a little too fast for you, I am going to be posting all this stuff on the insnyder.blogspot.com by the end of the day. Uh, and there's a corresponding, you know, Snyder Cut post that goes up on collider.com as well. That's where, you know, you'll see the top 10 film stuff and all that. Anyways, top 25 TV shows of 2020, because there was a lot. I, I, I couldn't limit myself to, to less than 20, really. Um, okay. Number, we'll, we'll count backwards. And I do, you know, I reserve the right to change my, my mind on some of these. But number 25, I put black as fuck. I really liked that Kenya Barris, Rashida Jones show on Netflix. It just... It's not the sort of show that I typically watched. I don't watch a lot of like black family sitcoms. I thought this had a a real kind of funny edge to it. I like the characters, the kids, um, some of the supporting characters. Like, again, I don't watch a lot of comedy shows these days besides like the old ones, like Curb and Always Sunny or or Seinfeld in the office. So to have a comedy uh, that actually made me laugh and and made me feel good on Netflix, yeah, it was it was a, a welcome departure. Number 24. This one that probably not a lot of folks have seen, although it is available on Netflix now. It debuted at the start of the year as a Spectrum original. I remember watching it in between screenings at uh, at Sundance. Yeah, it came out all the way at the top of the year when people were still sort of talking about the movie Richard Jewell. But this is the TV show, Manhunt, Deadly Games. I really loved what the Manhunt team did that first season with the Unabomber. This one was about uh, Richard Jewell. And it's like, there was totally, who knew? There was totally room in the marketplace for these two versions of the story. Like, yeah, there's plenty of similarities, but um, the show obviously obviously makes it much more expansive than, than Clint Eastwood's movie. And as good as Paul Walter Hauser was in the film, I thought Cameron Britton did a great job as well. On, on the TV side, I loved Arliss Howard's, like, bomb expert. Like, we don't get enough Arliss Howard. He was great in Mank as well this year. Um, so, yeah, Manhunt, Deadly Games. If you haven't checked out that series, I thought it was a very thoughtful take on the Atlanta uh, bo- Olympic bombing. 23, The Boys, Season 2. I thought the, the show took a step back this year. I think the first season would, was probably, like, a top 10 or 15 show um this is this is merely number 23 but I, i'd be lying if i if i said i didn't enjoy this i you know i thought homelander and uh the stuff with aya cash's character stormfront like there was some really really good stuff in there um 
yeah, the season was a little messy. Like it got off to a rocky start because didn't have Billy Butcher in that first episode. I think he's sort of key to the whole show. Again, that first season, I, I wasn't familiar with the boys' comics, so the characters all felt new. The tone felt new. You know, it's, it, it's obviously not going to feel new this time around, but uh, st still a solid season of television, I think. 22 is Mythic Quest, Raven's Banquet, the Apple series from Rob McElhaney. Just a really fun, you know, on, ensemble. Um, not, I mean, not, not much to say about this. It was just like, what was it, a four or five hour investment? They either had eight or 10 episodes, a half hour piece. Like the show just flew by and get it all done in one afternoon. It was like Ted Lasso in, in that respect, although Ted Lasso felt, you know, cut a lot deeper. Uh, and, and that is a little bit higher up on the list. Um, so yeah, Mythic Quest, Raven's Banquet. If you haven't checked that out on Apple, do it. 21, Ratchet. I know th this show wasn't amazing either. It kind of tailed off in its second half, but I love those first four or five episodes. Um, this was just a, I'm not like a big Ryan Murphy guy. I like American Crime Story, but I don't watch Horror Story or Glee. I didn't even watch The Prom this year. Uh, but there was something about the tone of this, the sort of campy, high-pitched tone uh, that, that I really dug. I liked, you know, Sarah Paulson. I liked the supporting cast, John John Briones. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I, I understand why people had high expectations. And, and this was obviously noticeably different from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But I liked Ratchet. 20 was Utopia. The Amazon series from Gillian Flynn with John Cusack. I thought I just thought they had like a great sense of style. I was kind of bummed that that's not coming back for, for season two because they did a decent job, you know, setting up this larger mythology. Um, again, just just a kind of fun show. I know, you know, even though it, it dealt in some pretty dark stuff. 20 was, uh, that was Utopia. 19 was Hunters, also on Amazon. Uh, I think this debuted in February again, just kind of had me hooked. Uh, and I loved how the first season ended. If you haven't seen all of Hunters or you, or you stopped halfway because, you know, the tone was kind of getting all over the place. Uh, go back and check out that last episode. I love the, the final scene. I can't wait what, to see what they do with season two. We haven't heard much about season two. Um, you know, they, they have to replace a bunch of their major stars. So there's going to be a lot of cast turnover there. But again, I, I like the world and conflict that they created. 18 was a teacher on FX. This is the uh, the, the series adaptation of, of the movie, also from Hannah Fidel. I just loved what um, Kate Mara and Nick Robinson brought to this. Like Kate, Kate Mara, this may be the best work that she's ever done. Again, sort of tails off in, in the later episodes. Maybe the series like peaked a little too early, but I, I liked what it had to say about trauma and, and how, um, you know, you may not even feel like you're being traumatized in the moment, but years later that that trauma sort of catches up to you. Um, so yeah, check out A Teacher if you're not watching that on FX. 17 was Tiger King. I make no apologies for it. I, I love Tiger King. I had a blast with it. It, it. it felt, it was like Shakespeare. Like it was just like so crazy. Uh, like, how, how can you not be glued to your television watching? And I, I don't know that I'd, you know, watch it a second time. Um, <laughs> once was enough living in that in that world with those characters, but it was a blast. It's definitely something uh, I'll, I don't think I'll ever forget. 16 was I'll Be Gone in the Dark, the HBO series about Michelle McNamara on the trail of the Golden State Killer. Really, really good true crime series. Um, and probably was it the best of the year? Second best of the year, I think. Second best of the year as far as true crime shows go. 15 is 000 on Amazon. I felt like nobody watched this uh, other than my uh, buddy Justin Kroll. Harold Torres, this guy's one of the finds of the year, I'm telling you. He finally got signed, I think it was by ICM. Um, this is like Narcos. It's like Amazon's version of Narcos. It was a little more like steely, not as, um, I don't think it had quite like the beating heart that, that Narcos does, but I also kind of like that about it. And, and it's just super well directed. Andrew Riseborough is really good. Check out 000 if you're into like global crime dramas. Uh, 14, Ted Lasso. What can I say? This movie is, uh, this movie, this TV show is unlike any other show, like, that, that there's out there like and certainly nothing that I watch it was just optimistic and full of hope and 
I love, you know, the Midwestern niceties and uh, Jason Sudeikis is great. I never would have thought that this would have worked as a TV show, you know, based on like these, you know, co commercials for NBC sports. But uh, I, I got to tip my cap to Sudeikis and his whole team. Like this is just a, a charmer and, and it makes you feel good. And, and I, I feel like there's not a lot of TV that does that these days. 13 is defending Jacob. I thought Chris Evans did a great job with this Apple show. He, he was fantastic. It kept you on the edge of the edge of your seat. It kept you guessing just a really, really well-made limited series um, in a year where, you know, some of the limit, the, the higher profile limited series were a little bit disappointing. 12 is the comedy story, the documentary on Showtime. I thought they did a brilliant job. Uh, Mike Binder did a great job uh, just exploring the comedy store. I mean, it's, he tried to do it warts and all. I understand there are probably some stories that he couldn't really tell. Uh, he only had, you know, five episodes to get into everything. But I, you know, lots of laughs and tears. Like, it was just a very informative, nostalgic walk down memory lane. Uh, and, and I thought it was kind of special. And, and also the, the best theme music of the year is the comedy store. That, that opening riff was killer. 11, season eight of Homeland. What a way to go out for this show. Uh, I thought that they totally stuck the landing. I love what they did that last episode. The, the whole last season uh, absolutely kept me riveted. And um, yeah, we bid farewell to, to one of the best cable shows in a long time. Certainly one of the best uh, Showtime series ever. 10 was season 10 of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Remember this at the top of the year? It was hilarious. I thought, you know, Larry came back, you know, maybe not stronger than ever, but super duper strong. Can't wait to see him. Uh, come back for season 11, and I'm sure they'll be tackling all the neuroses that come out of this uh, pandemic and the coronavirus. But season 10, I mean, that John Hamm episode was brilliant. Um, really, it's, I'm glad Larry's still churning out Curb episodes. Nine is Little America, the anthology series on on uh, Apple. This guy, I almost forgot about this in making my list. Like, it, that's how sort of under the radar it, it, it flew but I'm telling you I loved like five of these eight episodes and another two were very good there was only one episode that I didn't really care for uh Little America I can't wait for that to return to Apple because it's just a brilliant format um telling these immigrant different immigrants uh, different immigrant stories with like really fun casts and and filmmakers and uh yeah I, I definitely hope that Apple continues that um, eight, I, you know what, I, I, I overlooked this in the true crime list. I guess uh, I'll be gone in the dark was number uh, three, but eight I thought was fantastic. McMillions on HBO. Like this is another one that maybe it would have made an even better two hour movie or maybe, you know, maybe it was one episode dragged out a little much, but like it was amazing. Like what an incredible story. And, and you're gonna see that, you know, play out a lot on the, the top 10 film list. It, with these documentaries, it's all about like what story are you telling? And this one is just as juicy as a McDonald's Big Mac. I, I I loved it. And I loved like the twist too. Like the ending episode was fantastic. Seven, season two of Narcos Mexico. This is just one of the best shows on TV. It doesn't get its due. It doesn't get any attention. Narcos is great. The whole franchise, whether it's Narcos, Narcos Mexico, the acting on these shows, it's incredible. Um, yeah, super psyched for, for Narcos to return. Uh, and Diego Luna was, was fantastic this past season. Number six, this is the best true crime series of the year. Uh, and again, one that didn't get much attention. I, you know, I, I don't know what it is about, about Showtime. You know, they don't get the love like some of their cable counterparts, but Outcry, and I know that this was on Trolls list as well. Outcry was tremendous. And, and this was the one that I wrote a review for and the editors didn't love the review. And, and you know, uh, maybe I'll put it up on the blog later today. I don't know. I still haven't decided what to do with it, if anything. Um, I hate to just, you know, kill a piece of writing, but you know, maybe the editors had a point. My point is that the series is absolutely fantastic. It's about a, a, like a foot, uh, like a 17 year old high school football star who gets accused of molesting like a, a four year old boy. Um, I mean, it's, it's sort of every, every guy's worst nightmare is being falsely accused of, of a crime like that, whether it's rape or, or, you know, to touching a little boy. I mean, 
And, uh, and yeah, it seemed like the legal process really, really failed this kid. Um, but you know, you gotta, you gotta draw your own conclusions, you know, maybe, maybe you feel differently. So, so check out outcry I guarantee you will not be let down. It was, it was five episodes and, and absolutely just super powerful. All right. The top five shows of the year. Number five, Dave, this was just a hilarious show on FX, like great acting. Little Dicky was amazing. I loved his girlfriend. I loved Gator. I loved uh, Benny. <laughs> Justin Bieber's like music manager guy. Fantastic. Everything about it, brilliantly conceived, executed. I mean, it was like a rocket right out of the gate, right? Episode one, you just knew, oh my God, like this show is special. And I almost didn't watch it. I was like, who wants to watch little like a rapper named Little Dicky? They're giving him his own show. Just a perfect addition to the FX stable. And speaking of FX, number four is Fargo season four. Great episode, uh, a great season of uh, television from Noah Hawley. What can I say? Like the guy's just, he has it down to a science. Um. Yeah, Chris Rock was really good. He got he, and he did get better as the show went along. Salvador Esposito was great. I, I love the entire ensemble, and I loved what it was saying, like, like the way that it tied to to season two and what it had to say about crime and race in this country and, and power. Uh, Noah Hawley is just working on a level that other TV showrunners and creators are are not. Like to have this level of consistency over four seasons of television with completely different stories and casts is kind of remarkable. Uh, I, I hope that they keep that going, um, even though I wouldn't really want to see anyone other than Noah uh, take that on. Number three is Ozark season three, a brilliant season of television. Uh, like what a rebound for this Netflix series, which kind of um, had, had a sophomore slump of sorts. I mean, Tom Pelfrey gives one of the best performances on, on all of television this year. Didn't even get nominated for an Emmy. Ridiculous. Number, uh, Laura Linney is just doing jaw-dropping work. Like, she is an incredible actress, always has been, and she shines, uh, you know, every episode of Ozark. Love that show. Can't wait for it to come back. And they're doing, you know, uh, I think they're shortened seasons for season four and five. But, you know, it, it did get two extra seasons. Number two, uh, I know this much is true. Masterpiece, right? Derek C. on fronts, Mark Ruffalo playing twins. He won the Emmy, deservedly so. Like, this was just jaw-dropping. And, it, and it's, it's, it's not an easy watch. It's definitely tough. It's, it, it hits you hard. But it hits you right here. Um, and, I, and I just loved, loved everything about it. <laughs> Thought it, thought it was staggering. Um, and number one, the number one show of the year. I just don't think that we'll be forgetting about this show anytime soon. I think this is the new model as far as athlete shows go. But number one is The Last Dance, ESPN, Michael, uh, Michael Jordan. I couldn't, like, it was riveting. Every episode was fantastic i could have watched another 10 episodes of this right and any other athlete would be lucky to get that kind of treatment the the, the treasure trove of footage just the the, the breadth and uh, of footage was incredible um it took me back to my childhood and, and watching these guys play and uh you know answered a lot of questions that i had about michael and just you know what it has to say about greatness it was everything fantastic the last dance i think that's a pretty strong year in television like I just named 25 shows and I probably could have done another 10 or 15 more. Um, so yeah, that, that will do it for the, the, the top 25 television list. Now we got to talk about next year. Okay. Top 10 most anticipated new scripted shows of 2021. First, I, I'll tell you right now, none of the MCU shows made it. And I'm actually looking forward to those, but that just shows you how much television there is. I'm going to count backwards. This is uh, 20 shows we're doing. Um, 20, A League of Their Own on Amazon. What's not to like? Great great movie if they can capture that same tone, the same winning spirit with this uh, you know, fun cast. I'm down to check it out on Amazon. 19, The Sandman on Netflix. This is a, a comic that I always 
heard about. I've heard, you know, but like, I, I have no idea what it's like about. Even when I did the casting story on Tom Sturridge, whose casting has not been confirmed. They haven't even announced cast for this. It's almost like done shooting, I feel like. It started in October. Um, I, I'm just very curious what Sandman's all about. Like, if it is as brilliant as people say, and it's like this comic masterpiece, then yeah, it's on my top 20 list. Plus, I just, I'm curious, like, well, I have an idea of who else is in the cast, and it's, it's, it is pretty cool. Um, I just, yeah, I just want to check out what, what they're coming up with, basically. 18, Mayor of East Town. This is a Kate Winslet HBO show where she's, like, trying to solve some kind of crime, you put HBO crime and Kate Winslet together. I'm going to watch it. Right. The same way, I, you know, watched sharp objects or most of sharp objects anyways. And uh, this Mark Ruffalo show or the Nicole Kidman shows like Kate Winslet coming to HBO. Sign me up. 16 is nine perfect strangers. This has a dynamite cast, including Nicole Kidman, Melissa McCarthy. Uh, yeah. I just, I, I like the premise for this one. And that is over on Hulu. 15 is Lysi's Story over on Apple. That is a Stephen King adaptation with, I believe it's Julianne Moore and Clive Owen. I mean, you keep casting actors of that caliber. Yeah, I'm going to watch your show, even though you know, I'm not terribly familiar with Lysi's Story. I am a King fan, but King on television, it, it very rarely works. So I don't know that I have the highest hopes for the show, but I also would not miss it. 14, Gone Hollywood. This was on the list last year. I, I don't, I think that this is coming to FX. I don't know if they just completely dropped it. It's, uh, isn't it Ted Griffin, right? The, the Ocean's Eleven writer? It's a, it's a show set in Hollywood about like executives and assistants and those kinds of people. So it's up my alley. It sounds like an, an FX version of Entourage. 13, Inventing Anna. This was, <coughs> excuse me. This was also on the list last year. Uh, this is the Anna Delvey show that's going to start Julia Garner as, as the woman who sort of worms her way into high society uh, in New York City. Shonda Rhimes producing. Uh, again, this is just a very fascinating crime story. Uh, I don't know who ultimately like got hurt in this whole thing, but Julia Garner, so brilliant for, for three seasons now on, on Ozark. Like, yeah, I want to see what else she can do. She was really good in The Assistant uh, as well this year. Uh, 12 is Foundation, the big budget Apple series. That looks gorgeous. Got to check that out. 11 is Dope Sick from, on Hulu. That has a great cast like Michael Keaton and Army Hammer. Like that's a limited series that I am definitely excited for on Hulu. And then the top 10 shows. 10 is Clarice on CBS. Yeah, it's CBS. It's probably going to be terrible, right? Just like The Bone Collector proved to be on NBC. However, I love these characters. I love Clarice. I love Jack Crawford. I want to see Buffalo Bill and all that. I just, yeah, I, I'm jonesing for, for new Hannibal episodes. And until I get those, I, I will settle for Clarice. Nine is Peacemaker. And you guys know me. I'm not a huge comic book guy. Um, but there's something about, you know, th that... Oh, fuck, it's Peacemaker. Like, I just like the tone. I like James Gunn. I like John Cena. And I, and I get a good vibe from this Suicide Squad movie that James Gunn is working on. So the Peacemaker show is number nine on my list. Eight is The Old Man, the spy series with Jeff Bridges coming to FX. Again, Jeff Bridges doing a television show. Like, I, that's just cause for celebration, let alone like a, a Cold War spy type of thing. Yes, sign me up. Seven, Scenes from a Marriage. That's uh, Oscar Isaac and Jessica Chastain. They've been filming that now for a little while. Um, who, who wouldn't want to see those two trade marital barbs back and forth? Can't wait for that show. The After Party on Apple is number six. That's from Lord Miller, and it's like a murder mystery meets high school reunion type of thing. Um, just a really fun cast. I, lo I love the premise. And Apple is just like... Apple is, they've got a high batting percentage, I, I would say. They need to like, you know, maybe put out more shows. It's been a while since I watched a show on Apple because I, I, you know, I've only seen four or five and I watched them all in like the first half of uh, last year. So I feel like it's been a while since I opened that app. Um, definitely looking forward to doing it for uh, the after party. And now for the top five shows that I am looking forward to next year. These are new shows for the most part, sort of. 
Five, Tokyo Vice on HBO Max. That's the Michael Mann series with Ansel Elgort. Uh, I mean, again, Michael Mann TV series. Boom, you had me. Four, Barry Jenkins TV series, The Underground Railroad. This sounds like it could be special. I mean, this could dominate the Emmys next year. That is coming to Amazon at some point. Number three is the Untitled Lakers series from Adam McKay. Uh, Yeah, I'm a huge basketball fan. Grew up hating the Lakers. Definitely curious to see uh, what Adam McKay's take on the Showtime era is. Number two, um, Impeachment, American Crime Story. This was on last year's list as well. It got delayed. Uh, with the pandemic and everything, it took him a while to, to get up and, and running shooting. But yeah, Clive Owen is Bill Clinton. Beanie Feldstein is Monica Lewinsky. Like I, I, I was a young kid, uh, you know, when the story all went down for the most part. Although I, I was I was getting to be a teenager. I was understanding what was going on with it all. But I can't wait to see it dramatized. An American Crime Story. I mean, People vs. OJ and Versace. Those are two of like the best tele- seasons of television I've seen in the last decade. So hopefully the third time uh, lives up to that. And then number one, the number one show I'm looking forward to next year. It is a, fa- it is a familiar show, although I considered it a new one. It is a revival. It is the Dexter revival on Showtime. Dexter got a raw deal, man, that the ending of that show sucked. So they just got to like, Get rid of that. Give this. Get, give this. I want to see Dexter killing more people, and I want to see him get an ending that that uh, befits him. But I am pumped for that to come back because I have missed that character. Uh, and as for the ten most anticipated returning shows of 2021, this is returning. Ozark season. Or, uh, you know, I'll start from the end. Number ten, City on a Hill season two. We shouldn't have gotten that this year. I'm told reliably that it will be coming out uh, next summer. I think on Showtime. Um, nine is Killing Eve season four. Season three wasn't great. You didn't see it on my list, right? But I have a feeling that they'll recover, that they that they acknowledge that season three was maybe a, a creative down here, and hopefully they, they come back guns ablazing. Eight is Euphoria season two. God, it feels like ages since I watched that first season of Euphoria. I still need to catch the the special that they released. Um, but you know, I, I, I am excited for this show to return. I thought it was a, just a very, very well done show with a brilliant young cast. Seven is the boys season three. We talked about the boys earlier. Uh, yeah. Can't, can't wait for that to come back. Ted last, I, I keep saying, can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. I can wait. Um, I'm going to be waiting, but you know what I mean? Six is Ted Lasso season two. You know, want to see if, if that is a show like that could be in danger of a sophomore slump, or are they going to be able to sort of capture that magic again? I think like that show felt like it captured lightning in a bottle. We'll see if they can do it twice. Five is Narcos Mexico season three. I am psyched for that. Four is Barry season three on HBO. That's another one I thought we were going to get this year. Um, but yeah, I would imagine Bill Hader will be gracing us with his uh, silencer at some point this summer. Three is Stranger Things season four. That's another show. I miss it. Like I, I, I want to see Hopper get out of the gulag. And, and I, mean, I don't even know if I'm going to recognize this cast by the time we see this thing. They're, they will have all shot up. Two is Dave season two. Um, yeah, I need more Little Dicky in my life. And number one is Ozark season four. You know, that is the number one most anticipated returning show of 2021. I think that does it for the TV portion of the show. Guys, keep in mind, we, we've still got all the MCU shows. Loki, WandaVision, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Hawkeye. We've got The Dropout coming with Kate McKinnon uh, as Elizabeth Holmes. Physical, excuse me. Physical with Rose Byrne on Apple. Anatomy of a Scandal. Pieces of Her, Severance, the uh, Adam Scott series station 11 with Mackenzie Davis McGruber coming to Peacock uh why the last man with my boy Barry Cogan Ripley with Andrew Scott on Showtime the North Water Angeline Dr. Death those are Peacock series uh only murders in the building right with Steve Martin that's on Hulu and then you got you know true crime shows like the Night Stalker I can't wait to dive into that on Netflix I've had the screeners but I've been saving them uh and then Monster the Jeffrey Dahmer story So ton of television coming at you next year. It is going to be a great year if you're a TV fan, but this is a movie podcast. And so it is time to talk movies. Let's start with 
my top 21 most anticipated movies of 2021. I don't know if I love the order of this, but we're just going to go with it for now. Number 21, Ghostbusters Afterlife. I'm a huge Ghostbusters guy. Jason Reitman's taking over the franchise now. He's got some, uh, you know, Finn Wolfhard, Carrie Coon in there. I want to see what they do with this Afterlife movie because I need to watch the taste of Paul Feig's movie out of my mouth still. Like Ghostbusters is a franchise that deserved better. Hopefully Jason Reitman is the guy for the job. 20 is Cherry, actually, the Russo brothers. I know I don't love the Russo brothers, but I've always kind of been psyched about this story and, and the idea. I want to see what Tom Holland can do, you know, outside of Spider-Man, outside of an ensemble-driven piece like, uh, you know, The Devil All the Time. Like, can this guy carry a movie? Does he have the dramatic chops? And, and you know, I hear, like, the, the filming itself is, is kind of wild. You know, it, it's... I forget how, you know, it just sounded very unique and ambitious, um, like six different genres, I think that they said. Uh, so yeah, I can't wait to see Cherry. 19 is The Little Things. We talked about that last week. We got that trailer with Denzel, Jared Leto, and uh, and Rami Malek. I love serial killer thrillers. When you put three, you know, actors like that, of that caliber, three Oscar winners, like, yeah, that looks like the new season of True Detective or something. Um, and that comes out on HBO Max in like a few weeks. 18 is Next Goal Wins, the Taika Waititi soccer comedy with Michael Fassbender. I mean, I, I just, I loved uh, Hunt for the Wilder People. Like, and, and Thor Ragnarok was good, but I, I just like Taika's sensibility, particularly when it comes to indie comedies like this. And I grew up playing soccer. Like I want to say, it's been a while since I saw like a really good soccer movie. 17 is The Card Counter from Paul Schrader, the revenge movie starring uh, Oscar Isaac and Tiffany Haddish and uh, I think Ty Sheridan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, Oscar Isaac and a Paul Schrader revenge movie. Boom. Like, that's all you need. You had me. 16 is Spiral from the Book of Saw. I'm a huge Saw guy. I think I saw every single movie opening night or, or before then. Uh, I guess they, you know, they discontinued press screenings, you know, for those later sequels. So you had to go Thursday at midnight, but, uh, you know, Chris, this is based on a story by Chris Rock. It's Chris Rock and Sam Jackson. It just looks like, not like, it looks like a, a serial killer thriller, less than more than a horror movie, you know, like the other horror movies were just sort of like put meat into the meat grinder and, and see what, you know, what comes out the other end. It was all about like the traps. And now we, now we're back to like cast. Like a, like a traditional movie. It's not just about the the traps and the machines. Like we got Chris Rock and Sam Jackson and and, uh, and Max Minghella. And I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what the next chapter of that franchise looks like. 15 is Nobody, the Bob Odenkirk movie uh, from Ilya Nashuler, who I thought was, you know, did a fantastic job with Hardcore Henry. Love the, the Red Band trailer for this. Love the tone. Uh, yeah, pump, pump for that one. 14 is Marvel's Eternals. I know, a Marvel movie on my most anticipated list. This is mainly because I have no idea what to expect from Eternals, okay? I love the director, and the cast is like dynamite, right? But it's not just like a traditional superhero movie. Is this the next Guardians of the Galaxy? Like, what? I don't know what the tone will be. I, I just, like, what... I have a lot of questions about Eternals and that's why it's on there. Cause it's an unknown quantity to me. I don't know. I'm not familiar with the comics. I don't know, you know, who's good, who's bad. Like it's just going to be a, a surprise, you know, hopefully. Uh, so yeah, I want to see what Marvel has up its sleeve. Cause I know, you know, Marvel is really hard at work on a lot of sequels. They're almost entered like the Pixar phase, uh, you know, where Pixar just sort of pivoted to a whole bunch of sequels cause they, they didn't have the original stuff ready, but Eternals, I think it's going to be a pleasant surprise. Uh, 13, Judas and the Black Messiah. Number two trailer of the year. It look, just looks great. Um, love those kinds of true crime stories involving betrayal. Uh, I, I want to see what Lakeith and, and Daniel Kaluuya bring to the table and Jesse Plemons. Like, for sure. Absolutely sign me up on HBO Max. 12 is old. The M. Night Shyamalan movie. Uh, based on that French graphic novel, Sandcastle, which I did read. It was tough to get my hands on that one, but track it down. I, I just can't wait to see what 
M. Knight does with that setup because it's kind of like a brilliant premise. I just don't know which direction he's going to go with it, but he's got a great ensemble. Uh, speaking of great ensembles, I mean, the next like four or five movies, all I mean, all these movies have great ensembles. Eleven is the Suicide Squad from James Gunn. Like, it can't be worse than the first one from David Ayer, right? Like, they have to do course correction here. I think James Gunn was the perfect guy for the job, and I love the cast that he recruited for this. Uh, 10 is Mission Impossible 7. I don't know if we're actually going to get Mission Impossible 7. If Top Gun 2 is coming out this summer, right? Are, are we really going to get a new Mission Impossible movie by the fall? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this pushed to mid-2022, but for now, it is on the schedule. And I, I got to see what, what you know, made Tom Cruise launch into that epic rant, right? Like, what movie was he protecting? Uh, you know, we had Shea Wiggum and Haley Atwell, and there's some callbacks to, like, the very first Mission Impossible movie. Uh, this franchise is, is the best, you know, active, currently running live-action franchise. So, yeah, so, like, tickets sold. Nine is The Matrix 4. This is another one. Like, I'm super curious because I have no idea what the story is here. Um, you know, one, I want to see Keanu back as Neo, but, but like joined by Yahya Abdul-Mateen. And I want to see the new like bad guys. Like, well, you know, where did Jonathan Groff and Neil Patrick Harris fit into this? Oh, the baby's crying. Google. Um, but yeah, all these years later, like Matrix 4, like, does Lana Wachowski, it's Lana, right? Not Lily. Um, does Lana Wachowski, like, is, is it just about the spectacle, like those Matrix sequels kind of were, or are they doing some kind of story course correction? Because, you know, the, those, those Matrix sequels almost tarnished the original. Like the whole franchise took a hit because of how sort of unsatisfying they were on a story level. So I'm hoping that the Matrix 4 can kind of get us to see that whole franchise in a new light. Eight is Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley, uh, which has a fantastic cast. I mean, this is Guillermo coming off of The Shape of Water. So, you know, he must have really wanted to do this. Seven is Joel Cohen's The Tragedy of Macbeth. It's weird with, the, you know, the Wachowskis, the Cohens, they're splitting up for, in 2021. Everybody's going solo, but we got Denzel as Macbeth and Francis McDormand as Lady Macbeth. So, yeah, that's going to be one to watch for sure. Six is Last Night in Soho. You know, I, I like Edgar Wright. I don't love Edgar Wright movies, but there's something about this one. Like, Edgar Wright doing a psychological thriller. It won't be so, like, tongue-in-cheek, slapsticky. Um, I mean, it can also not be good. Uh, I, could, I could definitely see that happening. But I like, you know, the cast here, Anya Taylor-Joy. Like, you got to give Edgar a chance here because he, he has – you know, been a, a breath of fresh air in, in movie making for the last decade or so. Uh, four, five, excuse me, five. The top five movies I'm looking forward to next year. Five is Top Gun Maverick. I'm not a Top Gun guy. Like, I, I don't love the original movie, but that trailer blew me away. I am a huge Tom Cruise guy. I'm a huge Miles Teller guy. You throw in guys like Ed Harris, John Hamm, Jennifer Conway. Like, I, I am psyched to see that movie on a big screen and, and that is one that you will see on a big screen there's no way that's going to streaming trust me four is halloween kills loved how david gordon green you know brought back jamie lee curtis for that legacy sequel a couple of years ago uh i thought he did a really good job like god halloween could have just gone so wrong but uh yeah david gordon green did right by the franchise and i can't wait for this sequel one second. Stephanie, I'm taping my podcast. Are you okay? I'll call you back. Number four was Halloween Kills. Number three is the Paul Thomas Anderson movie. It's currently untitled, rumored to be called Soggy Bottom. New Paul Thomas Anderson movie. I need to say no more. I'm very curious who else is in this cast because I feel like we know very little about it. Uh, two is Candyman. You're in the house. I'm in the house of the Candyman right now. Grew up loving that franchise. Really want to see uh, what Nia DaCosta and Jordan Peele have brought to it. And number one is Wes Anderson's The French the, the French Dispatch. You know, like great cast. Another Fran McDormand movie. Timmy Chalamet. Bill Murray, right? I mean, it's Wes Anderson doing his thing. 
with freaking Benicio del Toro. Like, I'm in. I am in. So those are the top 21 most anticipated movies of 2021. We're cruising through this, this yearly recap. Uh, all right, we're going to do the top 10 movies of the year, the top 10 worst movies of the year. Uh, but first, more important than almost anything, the top 10 movies I missed in 2020. Number 10, Black Bear. Really wanted to see that Aubrey Plaza, Christopher Abbott movie, but I, I also heard it was like weird. And like, I just wasn't, like I, I wasn't in the mood for a weird movie that like didn't go anywhere. This came out on VOD like in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Excuse me. So basically, um, I would have seen Black Bear. I would have caught up with that on VOD if it had come out a little bit earlier this year, but I just could not squeeze it in for the end of the year stuff. Nine, Wolf Walkers, the Apple animated uh, movie. Everyone says it's fantastic. Like, I, I wish I had more time for animation in general. Um, I never saw any of this director stuff, like the Song of the Sea and, and the, the, the other Irish movie he did. I mean, I love the style of animation everything. I just couldn't psych myself up enough to watch it. Eight is the Wild Goose Lake. Uh, again, don't know much about it. It's some kind of Asian crime thriller. I've heard great things about it. The trailer looked good. Just could never get around to seeing it. Seven was the mole agent. That's like the guy who, who like goes undercover into like a nursing home. Uh, again, sounded fun. I think they sent me the screener. I just never got around to it. That's the thing. So timing is everything when it comes to these movies, right? Like, and we're going to talk about that uh, next to the movies that I started watching and didn't quite finish. Cause it's like not fair to say, I just like turned off these movies because I didn't like them. Cause that's not true. Normally that is what the, the movies in that section represent, but this year it, just, it wasn't. Uh, movies I missed in 2020. Number six was Ammonite, the Kate Winslet, Saoirse Ronan movie. That, that's one where it's just like the reviews were okay. Everyone said that the performances were really good, but the movie itself, like, Portrait of a Lady on Fire did it better. So yeah, I couldn't bring myself to watch another one of those types of movies, but I know I, I shouldn't have seen it. Five is Wendy from Ben Zeitlin. This is another one where it's like, I, I just, you know, what is happening here? Too many calls. It was my brother. Um, Wendy, you know, do I need another Peter Pan and Wendy movie? Like I heard it was gorgeous. I, I, like, I heard it was just very, different and and that's why it's on this list like, i feel bad these are the movies that i feel bad about missing but also couldn't really bring myself to watch this year uh for the kid detective this is one i just kind of missed because if that was uh, available on vod in the last couple of weeks i definitely would have checked it out but it was just a really fun indie quirky mystery comedy with adam brody so i'm definitely going to see that next month when it hits vod three is the load I don't even know where this is from, like Norway, Sweden, Denmark, maybe one of those, but it's a, a foreign crime film. And I love uh, those, the, like that whole like genre of movie. Uh, so really wanted to see The Load. The Trader is another one I wanted to see. That was number two. And I don't know if The Trader was rentable on Apple. Um, I don't even know if it was on Apple number one, but if it is, it may have just been for buy. Uh, and I didn't want to pull the trigger on that for whatever reason, but and plus the, the running time on this gave me pause. It's like two and a half hours or maybe a little bit longer. Uh, but, you know, th these are basically the movies where it's like, if I had nothing to do and I didn't have to worry about a job, right? I just had to pick movies to sit there on my couch and watch. Yeah, The Trader would have been number two. And number one, uh, a documentary that everybody said was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I don't know what my reticence was, but it was Bloody Nose, Empty Pockets. That, that, like, I would have loved to have seen this in, in a world in which time, there were, there were no time constraints, but alas, you know, tough choices had to be made. So those are the movies that I missed in 2020. Um, okay, we're almost there. We're almost there, guys. The movies that I started watching, um, this is, what is the section called? It's called the In Progress section. And, you know, the note that I have on, on the blog, which again is the insnider.blogspot.com bookmark it, guys. It's such a valuable resource, I promise you. I wouldn't say that if I didn't think that it really was. Uh, it's a valuable resource for you throughout the, throughout the entire year. No matter what time of year it is, you can go to that blog, that, that, that you know, my blog, and see, here are the movies Jeff thought were great. Here are the movies he thought you should avoid. Here are the movies he thought sucked. And it's all there for you. 
um, spelled out pretty clearly. So these are the in progress ones. The note is I started watching these, but I never quite finished. Make of that what you will. And that's normally where the note ends. But this year I added onto the note, make of that what you will, but not always. Sometimes it's just a matter of viewing circumstance. And I would say that's the case for, you know, 90% of these movies. There's only seven of them. Uh, but the movies that I started, when I started for a reason, but I just didn't finish them, the 40-year-old version, like the, the 40-year-old version, Black is King, Jalakatu, Nocturne on Amazon, Shirley, Shithouse, and Time. Now, 40-year-old version and Shirley and Time and Shithouse, these are like four of the most acclaimed movies of the year. So I'm not sitting here telling you that they're bad. I'm just telling you that when I put them on, it was not a good time. Like I just, what my head wasn't in it. So 40 year old version, um, I actually really like this is, that's the movie on this list. And it's like, I would love to finish that. Um, Black is King. That's the one movie on this list that I just don't think is for me. That's one that Stephanie wanted me to watch. And, uh, you know, I, I get it and I get why people loved it. Um, but it, you know, it felt like a, a concept album. Like it felt like, Beyonce's music video for The Lion King. And I just didn't need to see that. I didn't need to see The Lion King interpreted in that way. Jalakatu um, was a, is a movie about like a, a bull or whatever that like gets loose in a village and just wreaks havoc. Uh, and, and I watched that for like a half an hour and then just got like distracted by something and, and never went back to it. So I, I would love to finish that one. Um, if I could have stayed up a little bit later last night, that's the one that I would have tried to finish. Nocturne, I gave it a little sample. That was one of the, the Amazon Blumhouse movies. Um, you know, I thought, I thought it was okay, but it, I also felt like it seemed very familiar and I'd, I'd seen it. I kind of just knew where it was going. Surely that's a movie that I just thought was like boring. I mean, I put it on knowing like this is going to be boring and I watched it for like 40, 45 minutes and I was like, yeah, I was right. It's just... I don't know, doesn't do it for me. Shit House is a movie. Uh, yeah, I just like watched it late at night. I watched a half an hour. It was a little slow for my taste. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll get back to it. But I never did. Um, and then Time, that, that, that's another one. You know, everyone says by all accounts is fantastic. I watched 10, 15 minutes of it and was just like, this is not the right time for this movie. And, and I didn't go back to finish. Um, so, you know, if I if I can finish those, uh, I, I certainly will. You know, January is normally a good time to catch up. Unfortunately, you know, now you get the Sundance titles and there's just so much television and, and we're still in Oscar season, right? So we get movies like Little Things and Judas and the Black Messiah. And, uh, you know, it's just... Uh, and I'll like the Christmas releases that are now coming to VOD, you know, 17 days later or whatever. There's just a lot. It's, it's endless. You can't, you can't see it all. Just why I'm trying to be more forgiving and like looking at colleagues top 10 lists, like, you know, particularly this year where it's not like everybody could get to the theater. And it was about what streaming services you subscribe to or what you're willing to spend $20 on on VOD. Uh, all right. We have reached the big list, the worst and best 10 movies of the year. You can't just go by the rankings on the blog either, guys, because I do, you know, shuffle things around. Into the Deep was one of the best movies I saw this year, but it didn't really come out. It was at it was at uh, Sundance, and then uh, I don't know if people are afraid to put this movie out or what the hell the deal is. Into the Deep is going to be a, a talker for true crime fans next year, but I decided to leave it off the list this year. We're going to start with the, the worst movies of the year. Number 10, The New Mutants. I don't know what they were thinking with this one and I love Josh Boone I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt he put together a decent cast for this but watching this movie it was just a true head scratcher like what is this movie it was all set inside of a hospital run by one person uh yeah it was bad it was bad nine a movie that a lot of people liked which was just mind-blowing to me because within 25 minutes my both of my brothers were like turn this fucking piece of shit off and that is Bill and Ted face the music. We waited 25, 30 years for that, for that sequel. That's the best they could do. Ed Solomon, you're one of the best writers in town, man. You gotta do better than that. I'm sorry. That, that movie was trash. Um, and I loved the first two Bill and Ted movies. Like I grew up on Bill and Ted. Bogus Journey is like a great sequel. You could put Bogus Journey up there with Godfather 2 and Aliens. 
But uh, yeah, this was trash. Eight, I'm thinking of ending things. The Charlie Kaufman movie. What was this? I'm just not a Charlie Kaufman, the director guy. This and Synecdoche, New York. And it's just like, what the fuck? Who, who like just thinks this stuff is a good idea? It was a disaster. It was a mess. And like you had to have seen the Oklahoma play or something to understand, to make heads or tails of this third act. Nonsense. Seven, um, I guess I'm not playing by the same rules as uh, the Into the Deep, because this is another Sundance title that did not come out. It's going to be coming out in the spring, I want to say. Uh, run, sweetheart, run. Just bad taste. <laughs> this is just Blumhouse. Uh, I, I sat in the theater at Sundance. I could not wait to get out of there. I, I was just like, what am I watching? This is so stupid. And I thought I thought it had a really good premise, but uh, the premise obscures some of the uh, unique twists and turns that that movie takes. Six is the Onania Club from Tom Six. This movie didn't get distribution. I think you know he, they showed it to me, sort of gauging to see like what I saw. I thought of it, but you know if you're going to show me a movie. Uh, to get my feedback like it, it is fair game for review and the Nene club was just middle-aged housewives sitting there masturbating in front of each other it was a ma- it was literally a masturbatory movie um no redeeming value unlike the human centipede movies which i actually think are good or at least two of the three of them five has come to daddy you know listen anything elijah wood produces almost a guarantee i hate it i, I think that the specter vision guys are swell guys uh, I'm sure that they mean well. I'm sure, you know, they, they love horror movies just like me. If, if I could revoke the movie making credentials of any like one person or company in Hollywood, I think it would be Spectre Vision. I think these guys have horrible taste. Uh, and Come to Daddy was, what was this movie? Like, who is this for? It was so stupid. No, pass. Four was Guns Akimbo, the Daniel Radcliffe movie. Has, has anyone gone from like A-list celebrity superstar to just like VOD bottom of the barrel garbage bin quicker than Daniel Radcliffe? Does this guy like, can he not find interesting indie scripts? Guns Akimbo this is a movie where, you know, two machine guns gets taped to your hand. It was so obnoxious. Three, Fantasy Island, the Blumhouse movie. What a whiff on this one. And, and it's like, I was looking forward to this. I, I, I like the premise. I like how they took this TV show and kind of rejiggered it. Nope. Total poo-poo platter. Uh, just terrible. Two is Scare Me. This is like barely a movie. This is like people going up into a cabin and just telling each other jokey stories for 80 minutes. It was... I can't even believe Shudder acquired it. <laughs> it, it was awful. Um, and number one, She Dies Tomorrow from Amy Simons, which is a movie that I've seen on top 10 lists. It made me want to gouge my eyes out. This is a movie in which nothing happens. People are just like, I'm going to die tomorrow. And then they tell a friend and then the friend wakes up tomorrow and the friend feels like I am going to die tomorrow. And it's like, oh my God. This is what gives indie filmmaking a bad name. Uh, a- Amy Simons, better luck next time. You know, what can I say? This this was like upstream color, which she was the star of, you know, like it just these boring, pretentious movies that drag on for ages. Uh, no redeeming qualities. I gave it zero stars. Uh, so yeah, that was the top 10 worst movies of the year. And for the final few minutes of this show, we do the top 10 movies of the year. Whew. Number 10. This was a tough one. Like, this is the one where some thought went into it. 10 was Class Action Park. The, the HBO Max documentary, I loved it. I watched it like three or four different times. It made me laugh. It, it made me cry. The structure was brilliant. The way it's all sort of fun and games until somebody loses an eye, basically. Uh, the, the, I, I just, I appreciated the characters in this documentary. Like I had, I, I, when I was putting together the top 10 list, the movie that, that sort of fell out of the top 10 was Athlete A on Netflix. And Athlete A is a fantastic documentary about, you know, the, the gymnastics uh, abuse and Larry Nasser. But like, is that a movie I'm ever going to watch again? 
Is it a movie whose personalities are going to necessarily stay with me, like some of the personalities in this very doc heavy top 10 list? No. And Class Action Park was just a blast. Um, I, I just kind of loved the spirit with which it was made, the, the, the nostalgic look back at, at water parks and a time when, you know, safety maybe could have been a little bit, a little bit better. Like it took me back to summer camp when I was a kid, it was just crazy. And by the time I was a counselor a decade later, it was all about, well, you can't do that. That's a liability. You can't do that. That's a liability. You could get sued for this and that. And like, you know, back, back in the eighties and early nineties, it just wasn't like that. So class action park was a throwback to my childhood. And yet it also had, you know, real stakes and consequences. And it, and it makes you feel that in the last half an hour. So I, I loved uh, class action park nine promising young woman. Uh, I saw that back at Sundance and it was kind of clear that it was the best narrative thing I had seen at the festival. Uh, Emerald Fennel just did a great job. Carrie Mulligan was, was fantastic. I love the, stru the, the, the structure that, you know, that's done in chapters. Um, just a great tone. And, and uh, it was very, re it felt very relevant for this year. Um, but really good supporting cast. Like you, you look at who Emerald cast as, these kind of scumbag guys and they're all guys who sort of played were known for playing the nice guy. I just think that this movie operates on a lot of different levels. And even though the ending, I don't think it's like a master stroke ending. It's like, there were some holes to it all, some questions that I had, but it also is a type of movie that just kind of stays with you and got the sparked a conversation and, and it kind of haunted you um, as it's haunted me all year. And uh, yeah, promising young woman, I've seen that uh, I, I, at number one on a lot of top 10 lists. And it's not that I would necessarily argue because um, it, it is fantastic. I just, you know, there were, there were a couple of other movies that hit me a little bit deeper than this one. Um, but yeah, fantastic job. Eight American murder, the family next door. Just a, uh, you don't get a lot of documentaries like this where it, it just like fr from the moment that the Chris Watts like appears on camera, you just can't take your eyes off of him. And, and you do it like you're wondering at first, like, I mean, how good of an actor could this guy be? He proves to be like almost like the Robert De Niro of fucking murderers. Like you really feel like this guy is innocent for, for a time. And then by the time the confession and everything rolls around, I just, the way it was narrated from beyond the grave you know, with all the social media stuff that they had uh, from, from Shanann Watts and, and the text messages, it just painted such a, a full portrait of her life. And, uh, and it was heartbreaking to see what happened to, to that family and that you just don't know behind the, the, the smiling facade of, of the neighbors next door, what is really going on in their bedroom uh, behind closed doors. It, it was chilling. It, it made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Seven is Assassins. That was the best movie that I saw at Sundance. Just a, a remarkable story, you know, two, two women who assassinate Kim Jong-un's half-brother and think that they're doing it as part of, of a game show, like it's a prank. Uh, I, I, again, this, this is, comes down to the story that they're telling, and it was jaw-dropping practically. Um, a, a really fascinating, interesting documentary I would urge you all to check out. Number six, this is a new movie to the top 10 list. This was the latest edition. It snuck in there just under the wire. I finally psyched myself up to watch it. The Painter and the Thief on Hulu. I loved it. Uh, just a kind of heartbreaking movie about an artist who, who has two paintings stolen from her. Uh, they catch the thief who was you know, so fucked up. He doesn't even know what he did with this painting, right? Uh, and she's like, well, listen, the least you can do is sit for a painting for me. And she paints him and his reaction to seeing himself painted, someone who, you know, people just look at as a criminal uh, and to see someone look at him with such love and this friendship that develops between the two of them. It's, it's just a beautiful film. And, you know, I had read ahead of time that like the last shot of this movie was devastating. And it was the last shot of this movie. I started crying. It, it, there was just something incredibly moving about it. So please check out that movie on, on Hulu. Um, I, I, I think that it, you'll find it very, very rewarding. Five is Nomadland. Chloe Zhao, the director of The Rider, she did another beautiful job with this film starring Frances McDormand as a woman just kind of living 
on the road, you know, and there's no goodbyes. There's just, you know, see you down the roads. And uh, I, I loved how authentic this felt, um, you know, with, with the cast of, n of non-professional actors, people who really live this life. It was just beautifully observed. And, and you know, Chloe Zhao is going to be making, I think, just fantastic movies for years to come. And we're all very uh, fortunate for that. Uh, four is Boy State. Again, a movie that I never would have normally seen if not for a great trailer that, that, that hooked me. And I was glad that I gave it a chance because it was great. Like I just, it reminded me of, again, the summer camp days and just being around a couple hundred guys. And, uh, but instead of splitting us up into two teams to just play sports all day, you're splitting up to, to debate politics all day and policy. And uh, it just gave me a, a a taste for the youth of America that I, I don't know that I had. And, um, and it was just fascinating. I hope that, you know, I, I hope that I'm voting for Steven Garza 15 years from now. Like that kid is someone that that's a personality from the, the documentaries this year who I'm just like, is a, I'm, uh, I'm always going to remember him. Uh, so if you haven't checked out Boy State, very fascinating, uh, just a fascinating documentary over on Apple. Three was Tread. Tread genius i mean this is another one of those documentaries that's narrated from beyond the grave but the story here is even crazier this is a guy who felt aggrieved by his town and decided to punish the locals by rampaging through their town in a homemade tank basically a bulldozer uh i mean one of those like stories you can't like you can't even make that up it could only happen in real life. And, and the insight that they get from the guy who actually did it, who recorded all these audio tapes and just the way that it's done, even the recreations I thought were, were fantastic. Paul Sol had totally delivered. This is one of the best movies of the year. Tread on Netflix. Watch it. You'll thank me. Also on Netflix, number two, Crip Camp, A Disability Revolution. Uh, this movie will make you laugh. It will make you cry. It will make you feel something. And it's about people who are just often overlooked. You know, we see disabled people, uh, but how often do we start a conversation with them? You know, there are people in this, in this documentary who are very, very difficult to understand, you know, because of speech impediments and, 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 you know, a whole host of reasons. But if you really listen to what they're saying, it's a very, very valuable message. And one that, again, just goes overlooked or, or unheard. Uh, you know, I, I could just relate to these people a lot. Um, and again, summer camp, you know, so much of it goes back to our own experiences and things like that. And it, it, it took me back to my own summer camp and, and how safe I felt in that space and how comfortable, like I just couldn't wait to get back there every summer. Crip Camp is a special movie. Um, and, and I hope that you'll all give it a watch. Number one, as you might've guessed, Amazon uh, Sound of Metal. This is a film from Darius Martyr, who, who co-wrote Place Me on the Pines, which was one of my favorite movies of the decade. Riz Ahmed, just a powerhouse performance. And, and I can see why Chadwick Boseman may win it all this year for, um, for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which was very, very good. Like, I really, really liked Ma, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. That was a movie I had to sort of force myself to even watch. Um, but Riz, I think, is just more, more deserving of the Oscar. Uh, I just think it's a, it's a career making performance, a once in a lifetime sort of role. Uh, and, and it just captures the heartbreak of just how quickly your life can change in an instant uh, and, and getting over that fear and, and, and becoming comfortable with yourself and accepting yourself and, and your circumstances, your surroundings. And so it's kind of a beautiful love story. Paul Racy gives if not, like he, he may even be better than Riz Ahmed. If not, uh, it, it's, you know, a top five performance of the year for sure. So two of the top, the year's top five performances are in one movie. Uh, Paul Racy, just fantastic. I hope he gets uh, nominated as well. So yeah, that's sort of 2020 in review, man. That, that is the movies and TV shows that I've seen. These are the movie and TV shows I'm looking forward to next year. I had one mailbag question that was sort of uh, asking me, you know, um, for sort of like the top stories going into 2021. I think I'll tackle that next week. Um, and next week's podcast will likely be on Friday because I'm out on, on Thursday the 7th. So look for the next episode, I think on 
Friday, January 8th, I want to say, if that's the right day. But it has been a pleasure to serve you as your uh, humbled Collider podcaster. Thank you for watching the Snyder Cut this year. I know it's been a tough one for you guys. I know you've had a lot of stuff to watch. You know, how, how do you fit in, uh, you know, 50 episodes of the Snyder Cut when there's 200 movies to watch and, and 40 great TV series to watch? So thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. I hope you all have a happy and healthy new year. And um, just hang in there, folks. Like, it's going to get better. 2021 is is going to get better. And uh, stay safe, you know. You can't let your guard down just because we're nine, ten months into this pandemic. Still got to wear the mask. Still got to wash your hands. Just be mindful of who you're around and, and protect your loved ones. We're all in this together. Whew. That'll do it. That'll do it for, for 2020. That's a wrap. I'm Jeff Snyder. I'm at the Insider on Twitter, Instagram, Cameo. Whew. 2020, man. Good riddance. Happy New Year. And here's to 2021. I'll see you then. Later. Later.